What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and welcome to the Meat Block Podcast. Coming to you deep from within the woods of the Pacific Northwest. I think I just saw a Yeti. I think a Yeti is my next door neighbor. Anyway, enough of crappy banter. In this episode, we are going to be doing a Q and A, and we're going to be mostly talking about prepared foods and added value, what you could do uh, to enrich your case in a retail setting, as well as what you're allowed to get from a slaughterhouse and much, much more. And please stick around to the end of the episode. I have a nice uh, surprise, a good friend of mine, Ryan O'Hare, who is a writer and a blogger, who is also a whole carcass butcher and slaughterman, uh, wrote an awesome piece and is going to be reading it at the end. So please listen to that, what it means to be a butcher and it's very exciting stuff. The following program contains material which may be considered adult in nature. Discretion should be used in deciding whether to view this program. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Now, this one's from Matt Jesse the James Two on Instagram. Say, uh, for someone looking into the re- retail shop, uh, they're trying to weigh the pros and cons of offering a hot menu versus diving into the curing and dry aging industry. Uh, was just looking for any input on the issues that can arise, and if you only did one of them, which one would you choose in addition uh, to a fresh case? So hot menu, or I, I assume that probably includes ready-to-eat stuff versus uh, dry curing. Yeah. So I don't know if this is hot in the sense of like you make broths and things like that for people to to take home or if you're talking about having a outlet for people to stop in on their lunches. Um, oh, yeah, that's that's a good point. Those are two different things, huh? Yeah, and if, if you're going to plan it so someone's going to come in and get a quick bite to eat, then you got to really know if you're equipped for that. You got to know what your market is around you if, uh, you know, because you need to be near where people could work who have, if it's a working class area or there's a lot of agriculture or if you have businessmen or women, et cetera, uh, or if it's just going to be cooked foods that people would take home. Let's just say they're talking about like broths and, you know, I guess maybe like pâtés or 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 a burger that's seasoned or something, you know, ready to eat stuff or something like that. Mm-hmm. What would you do between those two? A curing program or or basically the case at the butcher shop I used to work at in Seattle, you know? It all it all depends where you are and what your health department yeah. will allow you to do. I am going to opt mm-hmm. to always do what's going to be the easiest uh, first. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I don't like things that are hard just means if you're building a program go with what you there's going to take the least energy in the beginning um so if your health department or your state regulations make you test for available water and things like that for cured items then you're looking at a few thousand dollars just in equipment alone to test that on site uh a lot of places don't do that just because a lot of places don't ask for, you know, don't request that. But some places do want to know available water and pH before you feed a dry cured item to the public. Yeah, I've actually been butting heads with a local health department official recently. And she's been telling me that in our state here, not only do you have to have, uh, you have to be, you know, complicit with water activity level testing and have a HACCP plan ready, but you also have to have a variant study, which is basically like you give a specific product and a recipe for that product to a lab somewhere, mm-hmm. these scientist cooks, and they, they replicate this recipe um, and find out if it works out. It can cost $10,000 or more. Yeah. Um, you know, I work with the USDA on dry cured products and we don't have to do what David suggests. But what we do have to do is uh, show available water, show pH, and then because of the size of our company, we also have to show nut facts and give the nutrition of the product we're selling. Uh, so we would have to send that out to a lab. You rarely would ever have to do that in a 
case like setting. Um, and then if you're going to be doing stuff like pates and stuff like a, a, a cooler of that nature, we didn't have to document appendix A and appendix B. I think you should. I don't know what it, it varies from state to state. Yeah, I think you should too. I think it's, a, it's pretty important. Um, I think that unfortunately the way the hierarchy goes is local health officials think that they trump state regulators and uh, whether or not that's true remains to be seen. But I, I think that um, as it falls, a lot of local health officials don't really bother small shops and they don't really bother grocery stores or rest or, um, you know, butcher shops, but the restaurants are the ones that, that really get kind of screwed. So it depends on uh, the place where I was, was, it was like borderline grocery store, borderline restaurant, you know. Um, but because it was mostly a, what they considered to be a grocery store, we didn't have to deal with any documentation. I mean, I, I could undercook or overcook the shit out of whatever I wanted and sell it. And nobody was checking on the ready to eat case. We didn't have to label anything as ready to eat. Um, we didn't have to label anything as pre cooked. You don't have to do allergens. You know, our charcuterie that was hanging, our pancettas, our guanciales, you know, our copas, whatever it may be. You know, we didn't have to document any of those things, uh, water loss, anything. So what would you recommend if you had to choose? Would you do a ready-to-eat charcuterie case with pat- pâtés and broths, or do you do a dry-cured case, charcuterie case? Um, you know, if, if, if the playing field was level, I'd probably, I'd probably do a, a ready-to-eat case. And the reason why is I would prefer to be making charcuterie um, I prefer to be curing and, and aging things, but I found that in the retail setting, the majority of Americans don't really want to put preparation into their food. They just want to take something from a package, put it into a vessel that's going to make it hot and then put it on a table. And, you know, we can make the best pancetta or guanciale all day, but they're still going to have to take it home and cut it up and prepare it and do things to it. Whereas if, you know, we're just doing pates or meatloafs or meatballs or what have you, uh, there's less responsibility on the consumer's end, and I think you're going to sell more. Yeah. So I, I worked in the second largest city in America, and at the time was, quote-unquote, the number one butcher shop in America, and we had a beautiful, beautiful charcuterie case and all this shit that no one bought. Yeah. And we Really? Were, yeah, we were in a major metropolitan area. We did things from you know, Copa de Testa. We did head cheese. We did hawk cheese we did riettes we did um like ear terrines we would do pate we do on cruise didn't sell it huh no i took home some of the best food to eat alone while i watched depressing movies and Pornhub. i don't know if we just if our problem was that we did too much but just some of the best advice i've ever heard is do what you're – pick one thing and be very good at it. So like have a very small item. I always get weirded out when I go to a place and, they're, and their menu is like so big because yeah. how often – and you're like the only person in there. How often are they cycling through this shit? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. I mean it's all frozen you yeah. know, or what, what, what have you. That's a great question. I think about that a lot too. I actually was just having a conversation uh, two nights ago about how – working with food has ruined the, the restaurant industry for me. Um, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. I mean, it's such a precious idea. It's such a great idea. People have, there's so much enthusiasm about fuck. Yeah. Charcuterie, local butcher shop. Let's do it. And I don't, obviously don't want to open this can of worms, but why is charcuterie so fun to write about in fucking GQ magazine and you know, wherever else. And it looks great on a, on a menu or on Instagram, but nobody buys that shit. We're not saying if you have a place that does charcuterie that you're not successful. I, I'm, a sh- I'm sure no, there no, are no. very I, successful I'm just speaking people. speaking about our stories. Yeah. But our experience is that we would make these beautiful things in two separate metropolitan cities that were fucking huge and, and huge food cities. In, mm-hmm. in re reound or recognized um, culinary achievements for what we were doing, people would write about this stuff, and no one ate it. 
Yeah, so maybe we ought to talk about, um, you know, re-merchandising the, the charcuterie thing. Yeah. Just it, as a group, the, the us and the listeners and everybody. Yeah, and if you have something out there that's, like, selling and working really well, let us know. We don't want your recipe. We don't want to steal your idea. Mm. But if you just have a couple of items that you're selling out of, I would love to know what those items are. If you have a case yeah, me too. that is doing terribly and your stuff's really good, I would also like to know. And yeah, I would yeah, that's that's a great idea. And I've I've heard the whole fucking uh thing of like it's our job as in that industry to educate the consumer. The consumer doesn't want to be educated. When I go to a place I'm like awkward and shy and just don't talk to me. Maybe that's, that's not true. true. It's it's a tough one. It's a tough crowd right now. Yeah. So what I would do to add added value, I'd put that meat on a stick and make kebabs. Jimmy James has two questions. The first, the restaurant company I work for buys whole beef to process and distribute to our different outlets, food trucks, burger restaurant, small meat retail case. Uh, what bits am I not allowed to get from the slaughtering process for the USDA or other, uh, other governing body? Uh, secondly, Jimmy James wants to know, will a heifer or a steer give me more marbled product and why? So what bits can't you get? You could get anything you want. It may be dyed blue, and you may have to sign an affidavit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. I think you'd have I think you'd have a a tough time getting your hands on the tonsils. Yeah, and the distal ilium. Nah, it seems like you could get that. But I think it, I think yeah, it would just be dyed blue. That blue dye tastes like centronel, so you could get past that, and it's still. And- uh, I mean, citronella smells like a backyard barbecue to me. Yeah, and it's safe to eat for pets, which means it's safe to eat for humans, in theory. Yeah. Real quick, we're talking about denaturant, which is a chemical used to dye food blue or black to make it unappetizing for people, so people don't go dumpster diving for uh, diseased-ridden uh, animal parts. I know the place where I work, uh, they they refuse to take cheeks. And they have it written in their HACCP plan somehow uh, that they're not going to dress the head. And so I, I can't have cheeks. Every set of beef cheeks goes down the drain or into the rendering for every beef that we slaughter at the place where I work right now. It drives me fucking nuts. Well, a lot of places, um, what do you call? It's going to vary from HACCP plan to HACCP plan, which is part of your food safety program. And HACCP is your hazard analysis critical control point. And it's going to, it's a system put in place to stop harmful pathogens um be it you know environmental chemical disease etc getting to the consumer so some places you're going to be able to get tripe some places you aren't because they're not going to have that written in their their plan to address how to get that to the consumer Uh, some places you're going to be able to get cheeks some places you aren't some places will give you oxtail. Some places won't even attempt to give you oxtail. People who use natural casings, that that plant where those casings came from had a HACCP plant that allowed those to go out. Yeah, so it's going to vary. You could, at, I would ask your slaughter, your purveyor or your slaughterhouse or whatever, what you can't get is most likely going to be specified risk materials, which we covered in mad cow disease, and stuff that usually is filled with shit and poop. Yeah, they don't like the poop. Yeah. But I have received carcasses from a place that gave you all the soft marrow. Do you know what that is? In the bones? No, it's the intestines. Oh, huh. Of, from beef. Soft marrow. Yeah. It it was gross. I did not know what to do with it. So, yeah, gross. So put it in the dumpster. <laughs> And uh, Jimmy James' second question is whether a, a half or a steer is going to give a more marbled product. I personally, I, I, I mean, I guess statistically in my brain, I lean towards heifer. But ultimately, it's all about your genetics and, and uh, how the maternal and the paternal side's marbled and what they're eating and, and uh, what time of year it is and how old it is. And, and I think, you know, head to head over time, I think I've had heifers look better. Real quick, if you're listening and you don't know the difference, um, a steer is a 
male beef that has been castrated in a heifer is a female beef that has not given birth. I would say that uh, the heifer is going to also have better marbling. A lot of people think that it's mostly steers you eat in, um, like that you see in a retail setting or in a case setting. Uh, working in a slaughter facility and doing big lots, I could tell you that I've cut, let's uh, slaughtered for the company, let's just call them uh, Together Foods. <laughs> um, and they were a mixture of uh, steer, bulls, and heifers. Really? Yeah. I think that's, that's interesting when bulls find their way into the food chain. At Israel Gonzalez from Instagram asks, uh, says, hi, I'm from Mexico and I've got a question. If I want to work with you, how can I do it? Sorry for my English. This is a question I get asked often. Uh, I work for a very small company. We rarely need to hire people. And But if you want... Also, what I do is mostly to make sausage. You don't want to work with me. You want, <laughs> you want to work with me five years ago. That's that's what you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. You want to work with someone like David. And what I would suggest is always, what is your goal in this industry? Do you want to be a master butcher? Do you want to be a butcher? Do you want to be a sausage maker? Do you want to be a slaughterman? What What is it that you want to be able to call yourself at the end of the day? And if the answer is all of those above, then start with slaughter. The answer is you just want mm-hmm. to learn how to cut meat. I get a job at a department store, or not a department store, that'd be weird, at a grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> go to go to your local JC Penney's and be a butcher. <laughs> no, uh, go to a like a grocery store and then transfer that into a whole animal setting. Um, yeah. Because there's really only a week's worth of training difference. And if you want to be a sausage maker, my company does whole carcass and we make sausages out of it. So I get to, versus a lot of other sausage makers where they're just opening boxes to trim. Yeah, that's unique. Find out what you want to do. Or if if you want advice, ask me, say, this is my end goal. Because working with me is not going to achieve it. You're going to... Uh, end up not liking me because I'm difficult to work with. And uh, yeah. <laughs> David, what what are your thoughts on that question? I, I like the idea of setting a goal first and, and picking a part of the industry to focus on. You know, I mean, I, I think I'd probably go in retail first and then got into slaughter. And I think, I think I'd probably go slaughter first, you know, now because as a few people have told me over time, slaughter's a young man's game, and I think that that's true. It's a it's a it's a young person's game in general, because um, it's hard, you know. I mean, it's like physically tough sometimes, and um, I'll tell you, I do both. So two days a week I'm killing, and three days a week I'm cutting. And on the days when I'm killing, on the seventh or or the eighth or the ninth hour, I cannot wait for that freaking cold room you know, with clean clothes and everything, sanitized surfaces and, and, and stuff. But then on the third day of cutting, I like cannot wait for that nasty kill floor. Say so now that it's summertime, you couldn't pay me any amount of money <laughs> to work slaughter right now because it's so hot and humid. I'd be Donald ducking it. I'd only have an apron on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, uh, he did that, you know, an apron and, and some, some boxer briefs. Yeah. It, it, some it, Crocs. That, that's the thing that, like, there's smells and humidity that will bring me back to a very specific moment in my time. I'm like, oh, this sure. This is, oh, I, this is working in Vermont when it's 100 degrees out. Mm hmm. But yeah, get a plan. Yeah, I would, I would I'd go to the local slaughterhouse and, um, Tell me do whatever shit job they have and then work on moving up. Um, also, I'd like to just put a call out to people and talk about the virtues of becoming a meat packer. There aren't enough of them, and it's a super fun job. Everybody that does it really likes to do it, and it's a, just a wonderful, wholesome career, and more people should attempt it. 
Like, what do you mean? Working in a packing house or like a, a cut and wrap? Whatever. We just need more people that want to wrap stuff in plastic. It's really hard to find. <laughs> it is very hard to find. I've worked with a guy who was making very good money and he would be like, thought he was above packaging stuff. And, oh. I, and I told him, you know, my business card says GM and custodian. We're not above anything. And also, like where I work, David, you don't have this luxury. I enjoy super remedial tasks of just putting shit in a bag as long as I got some choice tunes or some good stories playing. Someday I'll make it there. This question is from at food, booze, and blues from Instagram. They said uh, they love the topic so far. But after hog day today, I was thinking about waste associated with the breakdown. We utilize everything I feel that we can in our small shop, but it would be great to hear some other perspectives on how to minimize waste and the importance of it. I think that's an excellent question. Um, you know, that, that touch, touches a whole lot of stuff. You know, there's naturally going to be a ton of waste with some parts of the breakdown, you know, especially the whole animal aspect, if you're only thinking about case cuts. But yeah. that's why we have value-added products. And that's why, and especially with hogs, it's so easy to use every single part of a hog again we uh to talk about you you got bones make stocks makes make demis you got the head you can make scrapple you can make a head cheese you can make a copa de testa you got skin boil that shit and put it in your italian sausage Mm -hmm. Um, or you got more skin dry that shit out and make dog treats out of it Mm-hmm. You got uh you could smoke your hawks. If smoke hawks don't sell, you could grind those up and use that for emulsification applications because it has great protein and great uh collagen that's gonna help with uh with binding. Well, I think one way to figure it out is is maybe to do a cut test on what it is that you're doing and, and having like a great grasp on how it is that you're going to merchandise and merchandising, you know, seasonally the, the place where I work right now, it's the same cut list year round, which is troublesome to a lot of consumers um, because we're still doing stew meat and roasts. And so uh, we find ourselves doing less roasts, having more grinds. People say they have too much grind. And, and um, I think you're, you're ready to eat area or you're, kind of value added areas there's a lot of money there whether it's you know a lot of the stuff you make sausages and um we started offering seasoned burgers to our customers and they were more excited about getting grinds and getting patties and um i think i'd advise against the specialty charcuterie stuff you know like the pig's ear terrine and the shank uh, aspect bound terrine things like that because they they look really beautiful but nobody wants to eat that shit so I think it's it's kind of like trying to fold those items back into what you already have possibly well I know uh, I know bone broth is big right now I mean it's been big for five years but it's still big depending on where you are and if you're in an area where it's not huge you know you can freeze demis and like you said um, I think if you go at the stock angle from not uh, hippy dippy health angle but from a, a holiday or seasonal braising um aid you know or, or an ingredient for that i think that's a good way to go if you have a freezer section uh at your store or in your shop or whatever it may be yeah um and don't discount the pet food yeah you no. pay a real pretty penny for whole pet food yeah and i where i worked we would take chicken backs organ meat all the stuff that we received because you could only sell so mm-hmm. much beef liver, you could only sell so much pork liver. And mm-hmm. we would in chicken backs, uh, bones are soft enough that you could grind that through a through a nice grinder. Uh that's what we do. And yep. grind that shit, put that into a a lugger, and it's like a paste. Yeah. Then, then you freeze that shit. Then you cut it on a bandsaw, and then you cut uh cut that into like patties almost and that's your pet food oh man that's a good idea i like the bandsaw angle on that we yeah. we just uh put it through the v mag and then pipe it into a chub yeah which it did it's, it's nasty i mean it's there's no way that you cannot make the gnarliest mess yeah 
doing it that way. So I, I like that freezing idea. Yeah, you would freeze it, fill it up to in a lugger, cut it into nine squares, cut those nine squares into like so many patties. Awesome. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Food, booze, and blues. I hope you're paying attention to that because that's great advice. And also, since it's not like, I don't even know if you have to label it anything other than, because it's all inspected food. As the meat block is evolving and changing and becoming this thing that I don't even know where it's going to end up. It's very exciting for me. I'm meeting a lot of interesting people and getting a lot of feedback. And uh, I thought this would be interesting and I want to do more things like this. I want to bring more characters into the show. I want to bring showcase this uh, industry in many different ways. So if you like this, then there'll be more of it. And if you don't, suck a dick. This next segment is written and read by Ryan O'Hare. As a teenager, I was a graffiti writer on Chicago's North Side. We spent a lot of time scouting and painting along the purple and red line train tracks. My best buddy at that time wrote the graffiti name Bison, B-I-S-O-N, sometimes B-I-Z-N. I loved his name. It felt primordial to my mind. It conjured an image of ancient man drawing outlines of large herbivores on cave walls. Looking back, there's some irony that coming of age for me was paired with this bison on cave wall imagery. Because as it turned out, my adult life would become an obsession with this image and this question. What was this human relationship with large herbivores that compelled primordial man to draw them on cave walls? What is it like to follow a herd of prey animals and to bend every ounce of our vast human skill set toward the intelligent utilization of these animals. Homo sapiens have applied themselves to these tasks of hunting and procuring not just in isolated regions, but across the planet, generation after generation, for 160,000 years. We know that children who regularly play certain video games can develop dramatic advancements in regions of their brains related to spatial awareness just within several years of frequent exposure. I compare this with our ancestors growing up in hunter-gatherer family groups. I imagine the way those children's brains were developing. Every member of those communities from an early age experienced full immersion in either the hunt dismemberment or preparation of these animal carcasses for food, clothes, and shelter. There's a tendency to think of subsistence cultures as being less smart than cultures of the developed world. But when you really start to step into the complexity involved in traditional food procurement, it is a vast ocean of detail and nuance. 21st century humans are carrying around the same neocortex as Homo sapiens on the planet 160,000 years ago. The same intellectual and biological capacity was there. Ancient men and women applied themselves to an ever deepening relationship with large herbivores with the same rigor that modern humans have applied themselves to industrial and technological development. Sharp stones pointed towards hunting and butchering allowed humans to begin to unlock the riddles that lived inside the bodies of dead animals. The eyed needle, most probably invented by women, made possible the sewing together of animal hides to create clothes. This was a tremendous breakthrough. The eye needle resulted in the great migrations of human groups into the colder climates and eventually population of the entire planet. Beyond clothes, hides and skins were often used to create shelter. The teepees of 
Plains Indians were made from buffalo hide, as were the blankets and rugs. Growing up in the Midwest near the remnants of North America's Great Plains, my friends and I would imagine the indigenous communities that had once followed the buffalo there. Perhaps to get away from the rat race of modern life, we'd creep along the Chicago Canal or follow the train tracks until we found a hidden spot to reflect. As it turns out, the vast network of canals and train lines cutting through Chicagoland were the highways animals traveled upon. Along these no-man's-land routes, we'd sometimes see coyotes and foxes or blue herons fishing and hawks hunting mice. We'd smoke a blunt and together reflect upon our human situation. These Plains Indians, not only did they follow the herds of buffalo, their clothes, homes, tools, artwork, and sacred objects all involved buffalo bones and tissues. What did that feel like to live this way, with my entire world infused by the sight, sound, and feel of this animal? In my young 20s, I worked on lobster bolts on the Gulf of Maine, There I found a village where every member was enfolded in the rhythms of the lobster migration. The minds and lives of the people were entwined with the fluctuations of the lobster as they journeyed each year to and from the shore. The lobstermen had doctorate-level knowledge of the underwater terrain they fished, as their fathers did before them. These island communities were at a distance from the fast-paced changes of American culture on mainland America. A common phrase when someone needed to travel to the mainland was, I'm going to see the English. The manner of speak was markedly different from the regular Maine accent. Working alongside these people, I saw a version of humanity I'd never seen before. Fishermen and women were in constant study of their ecosystem. Day and night, they lived with one eye constantly tracking the changes in wind, weather, tide, temperature, and daylight. One year in the off-season from Lobster and I traveled to an even more geographically isolated region, the high Himalayan region of Ladakh. Here, during the weeks we spent trekking to remote villages, I saw true subsistence agriculture in the river valleys and true nomadic hunter-gatherer across the Himalayan range. Though there was a push from Indian government to build economy with rice and lentil production, the locals saw these as foreign foods from a foreign government. Their high elevation location allowed families to live their traditional life way unobstructed. And it was only in recent decades that outside pressures of industry and tourism came in. Ladakis are master irrigators. Each valley community was lush with fruit trees and barley fields. Each family had a milking zoo, which is a female yak, in a ground floor stable below their homes, and many had sheep that were collectively herded to a high pasture every day. As we arrived at each village, we would first help with agricultural chores and then sit around the hearth together into the evening, drinking butter tea. These communities were well fed with a rich and varied diet. The nomad groups I only saw at a distance. They traveled in small family groups, sleeping in portable yurts, as they followed the herds of wild yak, wild sheep, and horses. Seeing nomads and staying with farmers felt like I was meeting real humans for the first time in my life. As I talk about hunting in subsistent cultures, I don't mean to romanticize or glorify them, only to gather clues. Looking at the long scope of our history on this planet, it's clear that in order to survive, we've had our senses tuned to the ebb and flow of things like weather patterns, bird behavior, flora, and fauna around us. Large herbivores of every shape and size were vital to the narrative of our species. We followed them, 
studied them and were fed and clothed by them. Yet they must have been more than just a renewable resource to these people, more than just a material to exploit. Otherwise, why would they spend time creating art about them? Why would they paint these creatures on their cave walls and build them into their mythologies? My conclusion is that human relationship with these prey animals must have felt like a devotion, a gratitude and devotion, on par with the complex bond we feel towards our children, towards our wives, towards our brothers. In all this, I'm trying to describe a long-standing intellectual curiosity of mine. Perhaps it's a spiritual curiosity. Now, I work in the meat industry as a butcher. I have made a career as a carcass cutter and recently a mobile slaughterman. Generally, we who work in this sector are perceived as outliers in society. To my mind, we are engaged in perfectly normal human work. Every day when we take up the knife, we are continuing the story of humanity bending our hands towards the riddle and the intimacy of animal remains. That's the show. I want to thank everyone for submitting their questions. There was a lot of good ones. And if you want to reach out to us on social media, you can do so. The Meat Block Podcast at gmail.com or tweet us at The Meat Block Pod, Instagram at The Meat Block. And uh, we also have a Facebook group, The Meat Block. And if you want to get a hold of me, I am at American Butcher on Facebook and instagram and david is a farm butcher and introducing ryan he is at gather and break hope you guys love his material there will be more of it and if you think you want to be a corresponder or you have ideas or a good suggestion for a guest please let us know on any of those previously mentioned platforms and those will all be in the show notes and to norm the number one 49er fan i will address your question in an upcoming episode i thought i could get to it in this one but it is on the docket so norm the butcher that's in the future our intro music is ring the bell and our outro is one of my favorite artists and she's actually coming to uh, my city pretty soon it's emmy lou harris with the song deeper well i encourage everyone to go out there and download it and listen to it and if you want to support the show please open up the podcast app on your iphone on uh, in itunes and just type in the word meat where the third result the meat block and please leave a comment or a review it really helps us uh get more uh listeners so if you want to be awesome like pit crew dude one two one uh who left us the awesome review on itunes or if you want to be even awesome like frankie d barber uh thank you so much just from no i read every comment every review on all social media platforms so it doesn't fall on deaf ears and it does mean a lot to us and that's enough rambling keep your knife sharp live in the margin keep all your fingers and uh, much much more uh, please enjoy Emily Lou Harris
trouble down a dead end trail, reaching a hand for a holier grail. Hey there, mama, did you carry that load? Did you tell your baby about the bend in the road, about the rebel yell, about the one that fell, looking for the water from a deeper well? 